I'll begin. Thank you. I'm Gail Lansky. I am um, been on this committee I don't, four years, I would say at least, um, maybe even five. And I'm heading off the committee as of June because my term is up. And um, it's been wonderful getting to know a lot of different people in the community by serving on this committee. Um, Lucas? Right. Uh, my name is Lucas Hanscom. I've been on this committee for one cycle, which is actually more like a year and a half now. Um, but we've only been through one one round of it. So um, it's it's interesting. And you get to see what's going on in local politics, which is I find kind of interesting, too. Um, we'll start with the, the oldies. I mean, the current committee won't go to the new people. I'm Rika. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rika Clement. I uh, also have been on the committee for one cycle, maybe almost two years now, and um, been enjoying it and I'm delighted to have uh, welcome Suzanne and Gregory. Okay, um, Nat. Yes, hi, I'm Nat Larson, and I've been on the committee for a few years now, a few cycles, and uh, things have changed a lot during COVID and the schedule and everything, but still great to always le be learning about all the good things that are happening in the community. So. Uh, welcome to uh, Greg and also to Suzanne. Okay, and um, Becky. Yes. Hi, everyone. I got to spend some time with Suzanne and Greg the other night. Um, so nice to see you both. Um, I've been on the committee. I was glad to see that Lucas and Rika both sort of stumbled over how long we've been on, somewhere between 18 months and two years, but one cycle. Um, so glad to be here tonight and starting the next cycle. Great. Okay. I'm just going around the, the Hollywood squares here. Welcome, Suzanne. Do you want to just do a brief introduction? Because I unfortunately could not attend any of the um, interviews, just to introduce yourselves to the other members of the committee and, of course, the people who are out there in Zoom land. Sure. Um, my name is Suzanne Schilling. Um, I've lived in Amherst over 30 years, um, <laughs> starting as a student at UMass. Um, and I've been involved in many different things in Amherst, but mostly through the schools and my children. Um, and I'm excited to get started on the committee. And I, I work at the University of Massachusetts. Great. Welcome. welcome. And Gregory, do you prefer Greg or Gregory? Uh, either will do. Um, hi, uh, my name is Gregory Bascom, and I too am a long term uh, <clears throat> member of the community, been in Amherst for about uh, 30 years, and UMass brought me here also um, back in the uh, early 80s. Um, I look forward to uh, uh, the work of this committee. Uh, I've been watching and working with some folks with uh, community development block grants on the other side uh, in the past 30 years, uh, but nothing recently. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the changes are and working with you folks. Thanks, can I just ask were you on the agency side or were you on the committee side in your prior agency research? side got it thank you thank mm -hmm. you um well welcome and we're so glad to have you and i think um it's just sad that we can't be together in person but who knows maybe next month if we have a meeting next month and i'm going to hand it over to ben to lead off on why we're meeting tonight Great, thanks everyone for the introductions and <clears throat> for committee members and for members of the public in attendance. Um, the purpose of tonight's meeting is uh, to essentially kick off the next grant cycle um, and to hear from the members of the public, from social service providers um, about the priorities for the upcoming grant cycle to help guide the work of the committee in um, putting together the RFP and for um, evaluating proposals as they come in. Um, so the committee is interested in hearing essentially what are the greatest needs uh, for Amherst residents um, in terms of, you know, all, you know, really the whole the whole gamut, housing, food, adult education, youth development, you know, all the priorities that can be covered um, as part of uh, the block grant process. Um, for those who are new to the block grant process, both committee members and members of the public, um, community development block grant funds are allocated to the town uh, via the state um, Department of Housing and Community Development. And the 
you know, there's some definitely some complexities to the types of programs that can be funded, but essentially it's, you know, social service um, <clears throat> type programs that directly benefit low and moderate income individuals. Um, and, um, you know, if you're interested in applying or learning more, if you're a new um, applicant, definitely feel free to reach out to uh, let me know if there's, you know, if you need more information about the specifics of the grant. Um, and so one more thing about the uh, upcoming grant cycle, just for full transparency, and so everyone's on the same page, typically, um, or at, at least last year, the grant was due in September. Um, so it was around this time last year that we held a similar meeting to hear from the public about grant prior, uh, priorities. Um, so we recently heard from the state uh, that they are considering pushing back the grant deadline until March of 2023. Uh, and I guess that for them, that gets them on a, on a more normalized uh, grant cycle, which is, I think they got out of that normal grant cycle due to the COVID pandemic and the extra round of funds that were allocated uh, through the CARES program. And so they've recently just made that announcement um, and we're not sure when they, they've made an announcement that they're considering moving it to March, which doesn't provide us <laughs> much clarity one way or another. So um, I know there has been some uh, resistance or pushback to that from other towns and from social ser ser service agencies due to you know concerns about gaps in funding, which is absolutely warranted. Um, and so certainly as soon as I hear more, um, we will let everyone know about the grant deadline and the timeline moving forward. But we kind of have to operate as if the grant's gonna be due in the fall, otherwise we're gonna get behind on the whole process. Um, and so we're holding this meeting today. Um, if the grant's due in the fall, then we'll kind of keep going really quickly. We'll have an RFP in June or, and then, you know, applications due in July, you know, grant and questions back from the committee and everything packaged up and ready to go to the state by, um, you know, whenever it is September or October. Um, if the grant is pushed back to March, then we'll kind of have a, a you know, extended, period of time to you know prepare the applications to prepare the RFP to release the RFP to hear back from applicants to review their proposals and you know hold hold th hearings throughout that extended period of time so um, we'll kind of wait and see but I think you know we felt it was important to hold this hearing now just to keep us on track for a fall deadline or for our extended period into March so just wanted to put that out there. And um, certainly again, we'll uh, let everyone know as soon as we hear from the state about the deadlines, so. Um, ben, may I ask, did the state give any indication at all as to a date when they would make a decision as to whether it's going to be March or September? No, uh, they, it was kind of, it was just made, their announcement was made kind of as, a, as an aside to their, uh, training for the 2021 process we had a whole training to start up the grant and they were just like oh and by the way we're considering making this big change for the next year and everyone was like oh <laughs> okay so no i haven't I haven't heard much about when to expect more information um so we'll keep our ears posted it kind of has to be within the next 60 days doesn't it? yeah yeah exactly because if they don't change it you know people we're, I feel like we're being smart and staying on the timeline for the fall, but other towns might get behind if they don't start that process. So, um, and uh, I guess one other announcement too for agencies who were funded um, as part of the 2021 grant, um, the state did sign our contract. So I will be getting contracts out uh, maybe early next week uh, for a June 1st start date. Um, so just wanted to let folks know while you're on the oh. Zoom call. So, yeah, I think that's that's all for me. And Gail, if you want to kind of introduce the public Hello. hearing. Yeah, so I guess this will start our um, public hearing part of this meeting. Um, we had set our priorities according to the survey that went out and um, our top 
items were housing stabilization, mental health services, support services for youth. And um, I'm sorry, I don't have the rest of them in front of me. And agencies have been invited to present tonight to speak to our priorities. Um, I don't know how many people you have that are not participants of the committee, but um, if people present, we're asking that no more than three representatives from each agency speak, and we're going to try to limit the speaking time to um, three minutes and to be mindful of that time limit. So Ben, I can't, you're the moderator, so you can see, and I know that, um, see who's coming next. And I know that Judith from the Literacy Project needed to go first because she's bringing a guest who had time constraints. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, so there's uh, 11 folks in attendance. Um, and I see a few hands up. Um, I don't see Judith's hands up. 11 and, uh, in addition to the committee? Yes, yeah. Okay. Okay, so then we will be pretty tight on the um, on the time limit. Yeah. All right. So I'll bring Judith Roberts into talk. Judith, Judy, Judy, um, should be able to unmute. And thanks for okay. joining us. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Can. Great. Yes. Thank you. Um. So first of all, I want to thank the town for the funding the upcoming cycle that we're about to begin in June and um. These funds are very important to the literacy project. So I'm gonna talk about the priority for adult education. Um, and as I'm sure you all know, the book and the plow are the Amherst town seal. So I'm gonna talk about the book part of the seal, although we like the farming community as well. Um, education and particularly adult education that's provided by the literacy project is an economic engine for the town of Amherst. Um, we are getting students ready to take and pass what was formerly called the GED and is now called the high set test, high school equivalency test. So this past year we had 47 adult students in Amherst studying five subjects, uh, reading, writing, math, science, and social studies to get ready to pass the high set. And literacy is really the key to the future for our adult students. And when they attain their education goals, they are better able to support themselves and their families. And thus the whole Amherst, greater Amherst community benefits. So along with studying and the five subjects that I mentioned to pass the test, our students also fall in love with reading and writing along the way, who wouldn't? And um, we had a memoir writing project this year. We had some live readings um, online. And one student said she found her voice and she felt safe for the first time to share her memories. Um, so the writing was really beautiful. Um, one Amherst resident that uh, graduated from the Literacy Project we call it graduated when you pass your high school equivalency. Um, um, he just graduated now from Holyoke Community College with high honors. So we're very proud of him. I would like to um, introduce Fakira. Um, is she in the audience? I can't see the audience. Yes. Um, okay, great. So um, Fakria is a mother of three and Amherst resident. She is a teaching assistant, full-time worker at Crocker Farm Elementary. And she is also studying for her high set. 50% of our adult students are working and going to school. And so she's just gonna speak a little bit about the experience that she had, has had at the Literacy Project. Can you introduce yourself probably better than I can, Fakria? Hello to all of you, everyone. I am Fakria Musawi, and I'm a student of Literacy Project. A uh, Literacy Project. So, a uh, Literacy Project is one of the best community that I join it for this community, and I learned lots of things. And so, with three kids, it's not easy to find your way and goals, but Literacy Project always supports me to be strong, to be, do my, uh, reach for my goals. 
And then this is the beautiful and great community that I found in Amherst. So it's a great uh, community, great uh, teachers, and great all the employee in the uh, literacy project are doing awesome. And I'm so appreciative of your doing for us. Thank you so much for all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Fakria. Um, so, so Judith, we gave everybody three minutes and you're at four. So I'm going to ask you just to kind of wind it down because we've got a lot of speakers tonight. Okay, thank you, Gail. And thanks to the town. I think we've said what we wanted to say. So we really appreciate the town investing in adult education. Thank you, Judith. And th thank you, Fakira. It's nice to meet you. You are very welcome. Thank you for all of you. Thank you. All right, Ben. All right, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna go in the order that the hands were raised here. So I'm gonna um, invite Laura Reichsman in to talk. Hello. Hey, Laura. Thanks everyone for spending your evening doing this. I really appreciate the committee for, and Gail, you just got off a plane, so that's heroic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I, uh, you know, basic needs are always going to be at the top of what I believe um, CDBG should be funding, because mm -hmm. if you don't have uh, the basic needs like food and housing, uh, you can't focus on the other things. Uh, it's heartbreaking that CDBG can only fund five, because... If you're in your house and you want to do better with a better job, how are you gonna do that without literacy? How are you gonna do that without some of the other things that, that may or may not be seen as priorities? So I would say everything you hear tonight is a priority, <laughs> which does not help you at all. <laughs> but I do believe that that is true. Um, over the, last, the course of the last year for our housing retention program, we have, um, served 103 households that without our advocacy would um, probably not be living in Amherst anymore. And that's the truth of um, the housing situation in Amherst right now. If you lose your housing, if you're low income and you lose your housing in Amherst, you will not live in Amherst. You will have to live somewhere else. The um, rents have absolutely skyrocketed. If you know anybody who has looked for an apartment in Amherst or even tried to buy a house in Amherst, you know how astronomical the housing uh, costs are. And that is true for our lowest income folks. So if, you're, um, if your Section 8 is at risk, you are in big trouble because you will, you, you know, if you have to move out of an Amherst apartment. You know, it's very hard these days if you have a Section 8 to stay in Amherst. All the landlords have raised their rent. So you are you are too low. The, the money that you can pay for a Section 8 apartment, all rents are higher than that, even South Point, which was always our go-to. And so what we find is a lot of folks who don't have Section 8s doubling and tripling up. So you have 10 or more folks in a two or three bedroom apartment. So it's really challenging. Um, it's always challenging to be poor. And now it's very challenging to be poor and live in Amherst. And um, it, it's, that's, I think, why that would be my case for why housing retention is just should be at the top of the list because uh, we want to keep folks in their homes. And um, the Amherst Housing Authority has really come down hard on folks lately. We have been in more hearings advocating for folks in the last couple months than we had been in the last two years. So it's been, I don't know if it's because of COVID restrictions lifting. I, I can't tell you exactly why, but it's been um, quite extraordinary. Uh, we work very closely with um, uh, community legal aid, uh, Francine Rodriguez, who is our, our lead on housing retention, works very closely with the staff there and we do a lot of advocacy with them. And I think that's just really important. And food's really important and literacy is really important and everything you hear tonight is really important. And thank you for having to make hard choices. 
Laura, thank you so much. Before you sign off, can you just um, uh, name your organization for the newcomers on the committee? Please? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just we all know you, but they. Yeah, I'm, not sure I'm sorry. I'm Laura Reichsman. I'm the director of family outreach of Amherst, which is an agency that's been in Amherst for 32 years, and we serve um, families in every, any way that they need help. We serve them, um, but a lot of what we've done the la la last year has been housing retention, a lot of immigrant work. Um, all our caseworkers speak Spanish and immigrants have been disproportionately um, hit by the COVID. By COVID. And um, so we've been doing a lot of immigrant um, services work as well. Thank you, Laura. Eva, can I just ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, Laura, when you said um, that the Amherst Housing Authority has been coming down hard on people, can you be yeah. just a little more specific? Is that around eviction or around violations or? Eviction, yeah. that people are living there or what what exactly yeah um all of the above uh, you know we've had like i said uh many many um hearings uh where they want to take someone section eight uh where we're advocating so they don't take the section eight. a good here's a one example is that um a, we had a client who uh, had did everything she was supposed to do and um, submitted all of her recertification paperwork in a timely manner. Um, the Amherst Housing Authority was backed up. Our um, client had uh, started earning, well, her daughter actually was part of her household and her daughter started earning more money. So a full year later, when they determined her rent, they upped her rent and they went back that whole year. And so now she owes thousands of dollars. And they say, if you don't pay it, we are going to take away your section eight, even though she did everything right. And there's just case after case recently. I mean, Francine goes to one to two hearings a week these days. It's, and if these people lose their section eights, they will be in trouble. So it's been scary, it's been scary. Thank you for that, it's, yeah. that's helpful to hear. Thank you. Anybody else have a question for Laura? Oh, thank you for being here tonight, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So um, next um, in the order here, we have uh, Loretto Ruiz. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having this meeting um, at CDBG the CDBG meeting. I'm representing Amherst Community Connections. And I've been asked to um, give a personal statement. And I was uh, talking to Wei Ling, who's the director of the organization and asking her, well, what can I say? And she said, you know, bring it from a life experience point of view because I have experienced um, homelessness. I've experienced a lot of different things, but I wanna actually begin my statement um, this way. So um, I feel that homelessness is actually a misnomer. I believe it's a kind of a false judgment blanket statement for something that we actually know as displacement. Um, and my first displacement was actually having to leave my country of Chile at the age of eight. I turned eight on the plane, fleeing the uh, political torn uh, climate in my country um, due to military industrial complex violence really. Um, uh, regarding issues of misunderstanding around human rights, equality, education, uh, civil rights, freedom, and the necessity for living wages. Um, also, uh, you know, the reality of appropriation of our lands and the misuse of our natural resources, regardless of the consequences that human beings face uh, with the theft of resources and um, that the ecosystems are facing at the end of the day. So I feel there's a fundamental uh, misconception in the notion that only some can and should inherit the bounties of the earth. I feel that through uh, receiving the gift of life, all learn to share equally and with greater equity. That means we have to receive. So. I think that's kind of where we're all at, you know, and the work in ACC, at ACC, one of the focuses has been, how can we help 
uh, service agencies that give the Section 8 vouchers um, do so more conscientiously with like a community focus because it's very easy to say, well, the lady in front of the church who's been there for the last five years has been on that list. Oh, she's just a drug addict. She just keeps denying uh, the housing offers because she doesn't want to move away from Amherst. So the idea that there's uh, community identity, I think is a very important concept to bring back into um, the idea of displaced peoples. Um, displacement for me is as much, um, it's, it's a much more efficient and accurate term for the political and social dramas and complexities that we experience as people and um, who, people who are also rendered powerless or untouchable in these days of the COVID-19 pandemic um, in the face of powers that seem entrenched in a system that is making sure that resource distrib distribution and the permanence of ignorance on all levels uh, remain enforced like fences and walls, leaving out some of the most valuable participants and figures that can actually help create the kind of world that saints and sages dream about and dare to talk about as well. Um, so that being said, aside from, um, you know, the harrowing displacement of my own personal history of my homeland of Chile on the west coast of South America, um, I first experienced the fear of homelessness at 18 uh, for rebelling against sort of the system. I decided to get my GED and travel cross country. And I ended up um, having to leave my house first because my parents were really upset that I wasn't going to go to college right away and that I didn't want to finish my senior year at Arlington High School. Um, so I was very fortunate to have friends and connections who housed me. Loretta, um, I just have to tell you about a, like a minute left. Uh huh. So, you know, I ended up on the beaches of Santa Cruz and um, got a really massive case of uh, poison oak, which I was very lucky to be treated by the free clinics there. And I ended up actually, after many years, um, going back several times to the uh, Southwest reservations of the Diné Nation, where I got to see the suffering people there, mostly sons experiencing alcoholism and drug addiction and not to mention the poverty. But one of the things I experienced was hunger. So, you know, resources is very important. And I almost started smoking, even though I'm allergic to tobacco, because walking through Santa Cruz without a job in the summer as a young woman of 18, um, I was very grateful to have food stamps, which I had at that time, which I was actually unable to get in Boston while I was doing part-time study at UMass Boston and working full-time. So- I'm sorry, you need to wind it up in the next- 10 seconds because we've got a yes, lot Gail, of Thank you so much. So um, so I've written three manuscripts, one of them in the New York Writers Guild after graduating from UMass Boston. And um, UMass Boston is not a Harvard ticket, as you know. And, um, you know, I believe that I haven't given up on my skills, but I also understand what it's like to be a Latina woman here, where everything seems to be uh, limiting the voice of those who are really in need. And why, um, you know, helping those in need has become a sort of criminal venture and why advocating for those in need seems to be such a um, horrible thing is really more where I'm coming from. I think we need to work on the language and allow the voice of the needy and the vulnerable and the broken to come through um, in a way that makes it so that people can be. And housing, obviously, is one of those things. And in the first oh, that, that's, that's housing, that's allow me, Gail, to I'm finish. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm working sorry. on this. So the Housing First program at Amherst Community Connections really reaches out to people like myself and others from El Salvador who are deeply, deeply broken in other ways. So I support the work that Wailing is doing at Amherst Community Connections and I support your CDBG for making your choices wisely in a time where peace is of a critical nature. Thank you so much. Great, thank, thank you. you so much. Great, thank you, Loretta. Um... My name is Loreto, by the way, Ben. It's uh, L-O-R-E-T-O with an O at the end. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, excuse me. Apologize. Okay, great. Um, next, we have uh, Lori Millman. Hey, Lori, if you can uh, welcome and if you can uh, click on mute, you should be able to join us. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm wondering if I can share um, a screen and share a brief PowerPoint. Can I do uh, that? Can you do it in under 
four minutes? Absolutely. Okay. You bet. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Me... Um, so, I mean, I just feel that um, I'm not able to um, have a student join tonight. Uh, many of our students work at night. So I thought I would just do it briefly. And I guess what I would like to say is- It would be helpful if people would introduce themselves in addition to their organization. I'm sorry. I'm Lori Millman. Thank I'm the you. director of Center for New Americans. And I guess what I want to start by sharing is that if you look at the Amherst Public School demographics, you'll see that they're more diverse than the state. And that the first language, the population that speaks, um, that whose first language is not English is greater than that of the state. And that English language learners are also a large percent of the population. And that gives you an idea of how diverse Amherst is. So what I wanna do is speak to the economic development um, aspect of the board's priorities, because although I agree that housing is a critical need and many of our students deal with it, I also know that organizations like the CDBG committee and the United Way often look at a spectrum of need. So the United Way, for instance, when they were doing their strategic planning, they looked at the spectrum of need from people in crisis to people who are becoming stabilized and funded programs all across that. So we teach English because without English, people are locked out. And we also offer free childcare so the children in our uh, child care program now are Afghan children who are learning not only English, but they're also learning how to um, uh, get accustomed to American norms as they get ready to go into preschool. And we teach civics, we make it real. We invite our reps and our state center into class every year to help people understand that they do have a voice. Um, many of our students are Afghan evacuees living in Amherst, and we're now starting to welcome Ukrainians. Um, we're also teaching a nurse aid training. We do this every year in the spring. And these are our students who are in the class right now. Um, we celebrate our community's diversity. And you can see that the Amherst public schools are represented every year. Um, many of the Amherst um, uh, English language learner teachers join us because they think that this is so important. And it's this Sunday. Um, we help students get jobs. As I said, many of our students are working at Cooley Dickinson, at the Musanti Health Center, and also at Amherst um, Dining Service, Amherst College Dining Services, UMass Dining Services. We put people to work. Um, we are in the process of distributing $46,000 um, from an emergency relief pay award that we got again from the Community Foundation, and we're paying people's rent and the utilities, and we're purchasing a lot of food cards. We're also dealing with the digital divide and giving out tablets and hotspots. We offer citizenship application assistance, immigration legal assistance. We help people get green cards. And for the first time ever, we're also doing asylum applications for the Afghan students. Um, and we help change lives. And we thank you for um, considering funding us. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Anybody have a question? I didn't ask that anybody beforehand. Questions? No? Okay. Thanks, Lori. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks, Lori. And next, I'm going to um, welcome Lev Ben Ezra yeah. in to speak. So I was very smart. I uh, to put the asparagus in, and it'll be. <laughs> Um, great. Uh, Levy should be able yeah. to join us. Yep. Great. Um, thank you so much. Can I ask a clarifying question before I speak to priorities? Sure. Um, can you, would the committee be willing to just share a little bit more about the survey that you mentioned and the priorities that were outlined in that? I just, um, at least in this moment, I'm not recalling, uh, knowing about that survey. So I'm just curious if you could share a little bit more about that. Ben, do you wanna talk about, I mean, you're the one that, <clears throat> I'm kind of the voice and Ben's kind of the one that takes the action. So back on yeah. Ben. Yeah, thanks for the question, <clears throat> Lev. Um, so the, let's see, it was probably in late April, maybe a little bit into May, The uh, we uh, ran a survey um, through the town's uh, online, you know, public engagement portal called Engage Amherst. And, you know, the 
goal of the survey was to solicit feedback from residents about the you know priorities for the um, upcoming block grant process. You know, essentially as we're doing tonight. Um, through the you know we did outreach to the um, through the schools through the town's uh, you know communication office um, and got about a hundred responses to the survey um, and tabulated the results and you know shared them with the committee um, at a meeting uh, last month I believe um, and you know I think the survey will complement what's being heard tonight and other feedback we get uh, in terms of priorities for the you know block grant process so great thanks so much for that explanation um, yeah I remember a couple of CDBG meetings ago the survey being discussed but I wasn't aware that it had um, that it had come out or was was open um, so thank you just, for that, that explanation. I just want to I just want to interject Ben are the results available on the Amherst Town website um I've not posted them to the website yet um I think there might be a link through the engage Amherst page but I, I can uh, make that more visible on the block grant website that way everybody can be seen by yeah. everybody yeah okay thanks okay. Sorry, sorry Liv go ahead no, thank you so much. Um, uh, great. Well, I really appreciate um, all of your participation in the CDBG process. Um, and when I am thinking about the priorities in this uh, in this process and in terms of needs in Amherst, I'm of course speaking from my vantage point of working at the Amherst Survival Center, where we are connecting with and learning from about 7,000 people annually, um, most of whom, the vast majority of whom are living with significant economic challenges, um, challenges making uh, challenges making end meet um, for a whole variety and host of reasons. Um, and so I really encourage the committee to consider priorities surrounding uh, temporary housing and shelter, supports for people experiencing homelessness, case management and family support, the kind of work that we're really working alongside people, um, individuals and families to access resources, to set goals, to navigate challenges. And I certainly would like to voice my strong opinion that food and nutrition needs to be a top priority for the upcoming CDBG application process. Um, it is definitely concerning to me to hear that that is, was not identified um, through the survey responses received, uh, because while I certainly recognize the, the kind of confirmation bias of the realm in which I work, but the, the number of people that we're coming in contact with on a regular basis um, for whom absolutely food and nutrition and their food security is a fundamental challenge and a challenge that because it is in many ways like the most basic of needs, then ripples out and impacts so many other capacities in their lives, um, whether that's housing stability or access to medical care or ability to maintain work, um, education, et cetera. I really encourage the committee to address all of the priorities that are identified with a focus on accessibility and equity for our diverse communities and with a strong priority on quality and measurable impact. Looking forward, unfortunately, we know that food insecurity is not only not returning to the already unacceptable pre-pandemic levels, but in fact is rising. I think many of us can relate to the high costs at the grocery store and the gas pump, um, but many of us in this room may not be familiar with the degree to which those actually render accessing one's basic needs completely inaccessible. The combination of that with the end of pandemic benefits such as the child tax credit, and we are seeing record numbers of people at the center, new people registering for the first time, which is demonstrating in real time the significant need in Amherst. Feeding America estimates that last year food insecurity was still 25% higher than 2019 in Hampshire County and 43% higher among kids. That is one in 10 county residents and more than one in nine kids. And what we know is that poverty and food insecurity are more than twice as high in Amherst than the county as a whole, potentially as high as 25 to 30%. There are more people that are struggling and the challenges they are facing are deeper. 
just in the last two months, March and April of 2022, the Amherst Survival Center saw more people in the food pantry than we have at any other time in our history other than Thanksgiving of 2020. Over these last two months, we exceeded in both months this year's November numbers, which are always our busiest month by far. We have served more than 9,000 prepared meals each month, something that we had only done in four other months ever at various surges in the pandemic. And similarly, we've seen more than a 25% increase in the number of visits to our fresh food distribution that provides daily access to produce and bread, numbers that we haven't seen since the very early days of the pandemic. So from our mode on the ground, there is enormous food insecurity need and it is rising. I have certainly mentioned in the past. Uh, an Bev, I'm gonna, um, time, you're, you're almost at time. So I'm gonna ask you to wind it down, please. Great, uh, thank you so much. My apologies. Um, thank you to the committee for considering this very important priority along with and throughout all priorities, the emphasis on equity and quality accessibility for our diverse and our accessibility for our diverse communities. Um, I really appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Lev. Anybody have a question? All right. Thank you again. Uh, for to confirm, I, I did uh, check again, Ben, and I did uh, find on the engageamherst.org uh, website, there is a link to CDBG and then to the survey results. So those are available publicly. Okay. Thank you, Matt, for your sleuthing. <laughs> That, that, that's the convenient thing about Zoom. I can I can multitask. Multitask. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Much better than if I were in a, you know. Yeah. All right. Ben, who's up next? Yep. Uh, thank you. Next we have Susan Nicastro from Big Brothers Big Sisters. Thanks so much. Hi everyone. I'm as Ben said, I'm Susan Nicastro and I'm the director of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. Thank you so much for all of the wonderful work that has been happening on an ongoing basis with the CDBG funding. And it's been a critical source of funding for our mentoring programs. And I just wanted to speak to the ongoing importance of, and the great need that's, you know, more, we see that need more than ever now, the need for our children and youth, especially at risk children and youth in Amherst to have access to high quality mentoring. And you know, that is the focus of what we do at Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. I think we, you know, we're seeing you know, the risk factors that have really been amplified in children and youth you know, through the pandemic and you know, all of the, you know, the family turmoil and the, you know, the increased disconnection that so many children and youth have experienced over the pandemic and the need for mentoring is just critical and just more important than ever to promote connection and relationship with kids who are you know most vulnerable that's you know that's what we're addressing and that's you know we're hoping that that um, that mentoring will continue to be an area of investment for CDBG um, at, again we're um, you know, the impact that we see mentoring having on so many areas and so many outcomes for uh, children and families, um, families of the children that we serve, you know, we're serving, with, we're focused on mentoring, but we're also providing support and referrals to the families as well. And, you know, we know that mentoring, you know, is demonstrated to show, you know, that kids who are, who have mentors are less likely to start using drugs and alcohol, are most more likely to stay engaged in school, have an increased sense of self-esteem, a more positive view of their future, and you know so many other benefits of mentoring. So I just urge you to con continue to consider prioritizing mentoring when you're making decisions about funding priorities for CDBG. And we're incredibly grateful for the support that we've received over the years um, at Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. So thank you so much for what's everything that's been shared at this meeting tonight and really appreciate your time and, and your listening. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Anybody have a question for her? For Susan from Big Brothers Big Sisters. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, so next up uh, it's Amherst Community Connections. I'm guessing it's Huayling. 
Thank you very much. This is Huiling Guini from the Amherst Community Connections. I would like to second what my previous speakers have been asking you, that all the functions mentioned in this meeting so far, whether it's supporting the youth uh, mentoring program, Big Brother, Big Sisters, or the food function carried out so well by the Amherst Community, by Amherst Survival Center, or Family Outreach of Amherst who help families stay housed. These are all very important functions. And I just wish that there was enough money to go around to support all the important work that we are doing. And the feeling of trying to edge others out in order to fund my agency, Amherst Community Connections, it feel terrible. And I wish we could do something to make our work visible and everybody fund it. So with that said, um, I do want to remind the committee members that housing is the basis of all things worthy living. To develop yourself in order to exercise your potential and in order to enjoy the basic life, having food on the table, roof over your head without housing, all these things are impossible to get. So Amherst Community Connections mission is one and one and only, which is that we believe housing is the solution to homelessness. So our work focus on nothing but housing itself. So we have the good fortune this year, three people I want to use that as example to highlight why housing plays such an important part in their lives. One, um, the names I'm using, they are not the real names. First one, for example, is Willie. He is an African American in his 60s, but because of a traffic violation, he was um, under the, he was being put in jail until he paid the bail. And because he has a part-time job to pay his rent, and he is in jail, so he cannot get to work and pay the rent, faces eviction. So that's one thing we realize the importance. African Americans, people of color, their ability to pay bail is not good. So the first thing we did was we raised funds to help pay the $250 bail money to get him out of jail. So today I am happy to report that he is able to get back to his janitorial job and make a little bit of money, pay his rent, which is coming due in two weeks. And a second example is a grandmother who is in his late 60s, a few years older than me. Let's call him Allison. She and her grandson, who is 16, will be 16 in two weeks. And the grandson has been accepted to UMass studying prestigious computer science program. But in order for her to get a job, while paying 80% of her social security toward rent, he, she has to have a Massachusetts driver's license because she moved up here from Florida. And because she doesn't have the $115 to pay the license transfer fee, she is not able to get a job. So we help her raise the funds. And today I'm happy to report to you because of the $115 we were able to raise, she went down to the RMV office, get her driver's license. So in 10 days, she will be able to get the real driver's license and she will be able to start working as that 68 year old grandmother. And the third example is Angelica. Wei -Ling, yeah. Wei -Ling, your time is um, nearing okay. the end. So I'm gonna ask you to sure. run down. Sure. Yeah. So I will use these two examples to demonstrate that housing is very important and we focus on housing, whatever is in the way of stabilize your housing, we are here to help. And sometimes you have to be very non-conventional. You have to look at the upstream reasons that prevent one from having access to housing is because of the other opticals. So in the work that we do, we have to be smart and we have to be efficient, but also we have to be very dedicated. So with the same heartfelt appreciation for all my fellow agencies. We are here together to knit, to knit this social fabric, safety net 
for all the families who are struggling. With that, I salute to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Wailing. Any questions for Wailing from the committee? Okay. All right, thank you. Um, next, I'm gonna invite into the meeting uh, Sarah Sargent. Hi, everyone. Thanks um, for all being on here late at night. Um, appreciate all the work you do. I'm Sarah Sargent with Valley CDC. I'm the Small Business Program Manager. And um, we have been a recipient of CDBG funds previously, as well as we helped facilitate um, several of the COVID grants that the town had. Um, we understand that as small businesses, as we're coming hopefully out of this pandemic, that um, COVID relief programs are for businesses will become less and less. So what we are still doing on a daily basis is meeting with the low to moderate income business owners, immigrant and refugee business owners um, to work with them to maintain their business, stabilize it or help it grow. We have a main focus on trying to help them retain the current jobs that they provide to the community as well as creating more as um, people start to continue spending money um, at this time. The other thing is that we have recently in the past um, year have developed a curriculum, a financial literacy curriculum that is specific to um, non-native English speakers that is um, focused on business literacy. We have done that in partnership with the International Language Institute and had over 50 students participate in um, January and February, and we have another cohort that is running right now. Um, we are finding that many of our immigrants and refugees that are coming here have actually owned businesses in the past, and they are looking to try and determine how, they are looking to learn how to do that here. Um, and as we know, uh, language can be quite a barrier. So between working with other agencies that are providing um, English language training, as well as then taking another step and trying to help them with understanding business terminology. Um, so I couldn't agree more with all of the um, agencies that are here and that there's only so much money to go around. Um, but we are looking again to uh, potentially be a grantee of CDBG funds to try and continue to help um, those in the low to moderate income immigrants and refugees um, elevate their incomes to so that they are no longer needing assistance for uh, being displaced or food stamps, etc. So again, thank you for your time, and um, I just appreciate all the support you guys have given to everybody so far. Thank you, Sarah. Questions, anybody? Okay, thank you. Um, great. Next up, uh, it's Western Mass RC Zoom. Not sure who that is, but if you could just say your name. Hi, this is Lydia Vernon Jones. Hi. And I have a comment, not about the social services, but but about other parts of the funding. Is it is this a good time for that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, tonight's meeting is not just about social services, it's, it's right. about all aspects of the grant. Thank you. Right. All right. Um, we're, we're just, excuse me, Lydia, we're just asking people to limit their comments, you know, not to, to three to four minutes, please. Yes, great. Okay. Thank yes. you. Uh, my name is Lydia Vernon Jones. I've lived in Amherst since 1981, raised two children here, and I am currently married to one of our former elementary school principals. Um, I retired as a social worker in the fall that Trump was elected because my concern for the well-being of the planet was greater than my concern for the families my agency was helping. As a social worker, I have paid attention to how CDBG funds have been spent to increase social services in Amherst. And thank you for continuing to figure out how to, how to help these programs. I am here today to say that you have a wonderful opportunity to move us forward on helping Amherst to take responsibility for Amherst's carbon footprint. 
Excuse me, Lydia, I, do you have a, is there a television or a radio yeah, on? Yeah, there is, hang on. It's kind of challenging to hear you clearly. Which vehicles are ready for transition? Yeah. You know, um, at this yeah. point, we could finesse the issue by Sorry, thank you. Other, other people are at other meetings here. Um, let's see. I think you have a wonderful opportunity to move us forward on helping Amherst to take responsibility for Amherst's carbon footprint by thinking with a climate lens when thinking about every proposal that is made, whether it's a social service money or buildings or economic development. In thinking about proposals that should be, and also think about proposals that should be made that fit within the guidelines set out by the federal government. Early in 2019, the town council created an energy and climate action committee. A charge was adopted, a climate plan was written with the help of outside consultants. And this was approved, the plan was approved in June of 2021. From my point of view, things stalled there with no energy director, no concrete timelines or priorities set. As a town, we are looking at the library plan costing more, the elementary school costs rising, it's important that any funds that can be accessed from outside Amherst be used to meet the climate action goals. I do not come with a proposal, but with a few asks. I ask that you, you invite an experienced member or two from the ECAC committee to come to educate you about the plan and you use them as consultants for your committee. I was involved in the creation of the zero net energy bylaw. We need a bylaw that requires every purchase, expenditure, rental, et cetera, in Amherst be looked at through a climate lens with a penalty for non-compliance. Until then, we need to depend on committees and departments to take on that lens. I ask that you ask hard questions about the carbon footprint of every proposal, that you look at how communities in Massachusetts that are at the forefront of climate change spend their CDBG money. Thank you. Thank you. Can you just, um, uh, you mentioned Lydia ECAC, can you just spell out? Yeah, again? the Energy or, and Climate Change Committee, which is a committee of the town council. And uh, they have a website or they have a- Energy and Climate Change Committee? Yes. Okay, thank you. And they have, it's on the town website. Yeah, they're a committee. Yeah, on the Great, agenda. thank you. And the plans on the website and yeah. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Great, um, thank you. And so that's it for folks who uh, with their hands raised. Um, I guess if there's anyone further um, who would like to make a comment, um, feel free to click the raise hand button. Again, that's at the should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, yeah. Looks like we're good then. Um, again, we're, you know, we're also talking about not just about social service priorities, but non-social service priorities, such as housing and public infrastructure projects, um, and also target areas for, you know, for the for the infrastructure projects, where in town are the, you know, priority areas? And Ben, there's a map, right, that we've looked at before to select the priority areas. Is that something that you can put up, and maybe we could? Um, I mean, I know in the survey, South Amherst was sort of far away the area identified by survey by the survey respondents mm -hmm. yeah um i'm trying to find that now sorry i didn't have it up it's uh the target areas now are um east amherst south amherst around pomeroy village center and uh downtown amherst uh, Sorry, yeah, I can't I can't find it quickly. I actually just reworked the website to re to reflect the new grant process, and now I forgot <laughs> forgot where I. Put well, I things. guess one question yeah. I have is um, my memory of the map is that we had that the town is obviously divided into these regions. Is South Amherst a very specific area? Could we make South Amherst bigger? I mean, I I was I'm not sure what I think people 
when people say South Amherst, I'm not always sure exactly actually what yeah. they're talking about. <laughs> and I wondered, I assume that on the map, South Amherst means something very specific. Yeah, South Amher the South Amherst target area was specifically around like the, what we call the Pomeroy Village Center. So like Mission Cantina and um, mm -hmm. that area, then extending up to the, uh, the, the apartment uh, the neighborhood on um, East Hadley Road with the boulders and Mill Valley and South Point. Okay. I mean, it was interesting because looking at the survey, the two, the it was pedestrian safety and South Amherst were the two highest mm -hmm. getters, but I'm not sure that those two things actually, you know, blend. <laughs> right. In terms of there needing to be more pedestrian safety in that particular area, so I wasn't really sure what to do about that as we think about target areas. And obviously we don't even know if there'll be a grant with pedestrian safety as a right, right. addressing right now. Isn't the side is the sidewalk project moving along and almost completed from um, the apartment complexes on East Hadley Road to 116 and then up to Groth Park? Yep. Yeah. So the uh, sidewalk extends to 116 and then this summer the uh, contractors will be um, finishing that off and putting a sidewalk along mill lane to bring people to Groff Park. Yeah. So that's from a grant from a prior year. Yeah, exactly. And then I feel like the sidewalks that we funded, my recollection were in the center of town, right? In the last cycle that we just did. Yep, yeah, that was on uh, Kellogg Avenue right. near, near the uh, post office. So yeah. that'll be happening also this summer. Um, any, does that answer your question, Becky? Yeah, I mean, without looking at a map, I can't really. Yeah, sorry. I, just... I, I hadn't even, I hadn't thought about it before the meeting or I would have um, given Ben a heads up. Mm -hmm. Well, um, can uh, I? Can I ask a question just along um, a different vein in that um, with your conversation regarding um, the timing for the cycle, will the amount that were typically awarded stay the same this year? Or is there any indication that it would be more or less? Um, there's indications it could be more um, funds available and that it might actually combine the 2022 and 2023 grants so it'd be delayed to march and then combining the next two years into one grant and i think yeah it would be typically we get around eight hundred twenty-five thousand, and they're talking more in the 1.35 to 1.5 range so that's what i've heard as of now but there's i haven't you know i haven't heard anything whether that whether we're still limited to the five agencies and three infrastructure projects or not, but um, so still to be determined, I guess. And if it overlaps into the next cycle, does that mean like a year gets skipped? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't totally know what they mean by combining the 22 and 23 cycles, whether that's um, my sense is it means they'll just push everything back to the start to have this new March cycle. Um, I don't know if that means they'll skip a year or whether they're um, just kind of combining them together. I, I'm not sure. Okay. What? It's, it's, fr it's frustrating. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so we're going to end the community participation now and is are there more things that we want to talk about as a result of what we've heard um oh well, yeah so i had um for the agenda you know we had the public hearing portion of the agenda um and then you know when we're ready we can close the public hearing and then move into the more public meeting portion where we can kind of discuss and deliberate and debrief uh, so is there anybody else left to um possibly raise their hand or everyone who's here has spoken yeah everyone who's here has spoken okay. yeah okay so i think it's safe to say we can conclude the public hearing part of this meeting and move on to the public meeting part yeah of this meeting <laughs> tad, a tad redundant so um 
are there, can I, you didn't send out an agenda, so I'm not sure what else we have left. I just want to make sure we're not going to leave out anything. Yeah, sorry. Um, so for the uh, agenda, I just had, um, I can bring that up shortly. Sorry. The, uh, it was just um, any announcements. And then if we wanted to, um, to, 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 here it is. Sorry. I'll just share my screen here. So we went through the public hearing, whoops. And then um, for the agenda, um, I think I've made all the announcements I need to make. And then uh, if we want to discuss and review comments from the public hearing, um, criteria, target areas, uh, and then if there's any additional public comment. So, you know, I think it's somewhat unstructured if we just want to talk about what was heard tonight and kind of the next steps. Okay. Does do we want to just go around and everybody does a debrief or do people just want to participate if they not to put people on the spot or people just want to um, let us know what they think or comments on people's presentations. Should we just kind of go around. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, Gregory. Any comments suggestions as to what you heard this evening. I have a question. Uh, the third item on the public meeting uh, was discuss review criteria. And, and being new, first meeting uh, and listening to folks, I was wondering what the criteria is for the review. Uh, and uh, you know, I was hoping that we would go through that during this part of the uh, meeting and discuss that because I'm not sure what criteria to be using other than what the regs say, you know, what's eligible, what's not, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, um, I can find what we used for criteria for previous years. Um, and I would think, you know, it makes sense to kind of use that as a basis. And then, so essentially the criteria, um, so I guess, yeah, backing up a little bit, the committee develops an RFP and part of that RFP includes, you know, what are the priorities that are included, you know, that, that, that are, you know, the committee is seeking to fund each year, but then also the criteria by which app, uh, proposals are evaluated. Um, and so I guess, you know, it's a little bit maybe getting ahead of ourselves to develop the criteria. I think the, uh, priorities are, um maybe the priority in this case mm -hmm. but the uh the criteria will be developed um you know a, as we work on the rfp but i think um it makes sense to you know we can we should look at those and i'm trying to find the rfp from last year because i think that would be helpful but Greg, just to, to be clear, so essentially it's the, um, I know we talked about this the other night, it, it's the categories, you know, food and security, right. Right. housing, mental health services for kids, youth development, you know, all those categories are the criteria. And so, um, you know, it's our opportunity to decide whether we want to um, limit the kinds of programs that we want to look at or expand or keep exactly what we've looked at in the mm -hmm. past, um, you know, and, and if we look at the survey that we did, um, you know, whether we want to use that as a, um, as a tool as we're determining what categories, um, you know, and I'm not suggesting this, yeah. but just sort of noting that, you know, for example, um, on the survey, um, economic development, I think was, you know, at the very bottom of, the list of people's priorities. So do we would we look at the survey and say, you know what, given the incredible need and the community speaking in this voice and saying economic development is not a priority right now, would we decide right now, you know what, that's just let, let's just take that off the table for this round mm -hmm. and look at housing and food and youth services or you know whatever we yeah. put in instead. Well I didn't mean to jump the gun or anything on this, but what was confusing to me is the uh item number two and item number three, because item number two says discuss and review comments from the public hearing. And then it says discuss review criteria. And I thought that meant yeah. discuss review criteria for the public hearing, not for 
Uh, gotcha. Was eligible, you know, so I didn't mean to jump that far ahead in the process. Uh, but, th th but to think about um, what do we look for other than uh, to, to uh, understand what uh, folks see as the uh, priority and need in the community. Uh, is there any other uh, criteria that we use in terms of listening to folks in the public hearing? What else are we looking for? Uh, in terms of getting information? That's, that was my question. So I think we're sort of um, relying on this survey to be the North Star to guide us. However, the comments tonight always um, are impactful and give us a more um, detailed insight as to what organizations needs are. So I think we consider what we've heard tonight, we look at it and reflect and then think it what, what we've heard in relation to what the survey has um, established. And um, you know, Lev was talking a lot about um, accessibility and equity, and that's something that we hadn't had in the past uh, as our um, criteria. And so we're moving towards um, being more inclusive as to what people suggest. Uh, and I think that uh, we are good at listening and um, good at responding. So. I hope that answers your question. So, yes, Gail, isn't yes, it correct? Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. We had, um, I thought that we had equity as a, um, not as a priority, but it was one of the criteria that needed to be in every yeah, proposal, uh, right? And so we, we talked about having it be right. a priority, but then determined it actually made more sense to have it just across the board that it was something that we wanted every organization to talk about. Right, and that's right. something new to this year that we weren't as, we, we hadn't been as mindful of in the past. So that's why I was kind of trying to explain that we've added that in. I yes, guess. every grant proposal should request um, equity. So we, we were trying to factor that into the proposals to the RFP. Can I ask I a just would, I would say, question. oh, sorry, go ahead, Rika. We did have a really good discussion about the criteria and all of this. And I, I don't, I mean, I was like looking to see if I was taking notes tonight, but I couldn't find notes from that meeting. Are there notes that we could reference? I don't, I don't know how that works. Yeah, there, there should be meeting minutes. Um, so I guess that was probably maybe this time last year, if maybe a little bit earlier this, than this time yeah. last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you mean just the meeting we just had, Rico, when we were talking about it? Not not tonight's meeting, no. No, 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 no but the one yeah. from last month? When we talked I about the like survey results? I felt like it was longer. I think it was longer ago than that. Yeah, now. that's my recollection. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Where we talked about, yeah, I mean, should, you know, diversity and equity be, be a priority or should it be integrated into all the proposals? I feel like that was much longer ago than last month. We, we had a meeting in January and I have notes um, from January that, um, you know, about equity and diversity and the quality of services um, to be talked about. And that um, we um, were talked also about shifting priorities from year to year. So um, we did have a meeting on January 20th and I do have some scribbled notes from them. But there would also be, it sounds like, formal meeting minutes. Yeah. So maybe that would, might be something just to share with everybody to mm -hmm. refresh us. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should get those as part of the meeting package with mm -hmm. the Zoom link and the agenda and the minutes going forward so we can kind of, because we don't meet on that regular basis and it's good for all of our memories to be refreshed before we Yeah, absolutely. Down. Okay. Ben, but I can find those online though, the minutes. Yep. Yeah. If you that go to the online, yeah, yeah okay. block grant website, yeah, I just I just confirmed that they're there at January twentieth, twenty twenty two. There's a little bit of gap. I don't know. Maybe there weren't minutes being taken in twenty twenty or haven't uploaded them yet. Um. Oh no, they're at the bottom. That's just not sorted. Yeah. Nate is okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so Gregory, do we sort of answer your questions? Yes, or that's helpful. Thank friends? you. Okay, Suzanne. Oh, well, my question was if, you know, we identify priorities, but we put out an RFP and an organization applies, 
um, and it doesn't meet with the priorities, but it resonates with the committee, what happens in that, that case? Or has that happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we still take it into consideration, right? Yeah. Now. I mean, we don't yeah. we don't exactly yeah. say no to anybody, and we have a um, and I don't know at your orient, you know, what you we have a scoring system, so and that kind of helps sort out for us um, on a scale how we judge the um, the RFPs, so um, the grant applications, so that helps us sort things out. Um, but I don't think that there's a category on, I can't remember if there's a category on our score sheet that addresses the priorities. Um, but, yeah, um, yeah. but we never say no to a grant proposal. Like the mobile food market, that was new last year and that was addressing um, food insecurity and, but it wasn't, but it was, it had a different format than other typical food distribution organizations. Um, and they came in and applied. And there are also ways for organizations who apply and don't end up getting funding. They usually get a little coaching afterwards through um, Ben and Nate, who is his um, predecessor, to help them figure out you know, how to make the grants more, um, I wouldn't say written better, but addressing the questions in a more direct manner and helping to um, helping these organizations who may never have applied for CDBG funding understand how to uh, be more to the point in their applications. And well, we also look at viability first off, um, whether what they're asking to be able to do is reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and if they can actually do it. So um, that's. Well, that ability to carry out the program. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I feel like a lot of this is gray. <laughs> for, for, you know, it's black and white, but it's sort of there are gray areas. But we do have a structure to the whole. There is a structure, and it, it becomes pretty obvious as you as you wade in. That was my experience. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else have comments from um, what we've just heard, Rika? Um. Well. You know, I guess the main takeaway, my main takeaway from tonight is that, you know, and, and I'm certainly aware of this on my own as well, but the needs are increasing across the board and that it's not going, you know, it's going to continue to be a very difficult challenge to award limited funds to so many worthwhile um, projects. And, you know, what they were talking, I'm sort of looking at my notes here, what they were talking about tonight. Um, you know, they're, they're the priorities. They're the priorities we're aware of and we, we know we want to fund and we'll do the best we can. So it didn't, it was, it was helpful, informative, appreciate the commitment and the passion that um, all of the speakers demonstrated. Um, it'll be a tough year. I mean, it'd be nice if we did have a lot more money and maybe, maybe not quite so restricted, but time will tell. Thanks. It's great. It's all true. Nat, any comments on what we've heard? Yeah, I thought that the messages from the familiar <clears throat> agencies were, you know, familiar messages, but it was good to hear the updates, you know, because things do change from year to year and, um, you know, good to hear things like where the new immigrants are coming from, um, you know, what the, you know, what food insecurity or housing insecurity looks like today, because it's a little bit different from, you know, what it was a year ago. So I was good to hear uh, things like that. Um, I think the only new perspective maybe was the, you know, the climate change perspective. And that's something that I think we're all very much aware of. And, um, but um, that's also a good reminder of, um, you know, an important issue. So I thought it was a good, a good session with uh, good information. Very helpful. Thanks. Uh, Lucas? Uh I don't really have much to add. I, again, I, you know, it was good to hear from everybody and uh, to to get some uh, feedback about what's going on on the ground from the people actually engaged in these activities. I thought that was very useful. But yeah. Thanks, Becky. Thank you, Lucas. Becky. Um, yeah, I would echo everything everybody said. Um, and I wonder, actually, I thought that um, that Lydia's suggestion that we hear from a committee member. Um, and I don't have the acronym up in front of me, but the, the energy the, um, <laughs> committee, I thought that was an interesting idea. And it made me 
I think that's a, a, a good idea. I also wondered if there were other committees, I mean, given, particularly if the grant timing is pushed off until March and we have some more time that we could kind of do some listening to, you know, for work that's already being done in town and, and certainly hear from that committee and, and determine whether there are any other committees that it would be helpful to hear from, um, you know, to just have a, a better sense of, of what's going on. Um, you know, going forward. And I would, I did want to just say, I, I think I sensed a little bit of, um, I was just going to address one thing that Lev said, um, you know, noting, I think when she looked at the survey, seeing that that food um, insecurity was sort of lower on the list. And I wanted, because um, I don't think that she was at our last meeting when we were discussing that, I wanted just to sort of say again, one of the, the, um, topics that we discussed or, or ideas that we had was that it was possible that because the survival center is so present and does such an incredible job in town that people might not think of food insecurity as an area that needs to be filled, um, you know, that needs to be addressed because they're there doing that work and that we didn't look at this survey and necessarily look at it and say, oh, then we're not going to think about giving money to food organizations that that wasn't how we looked at that survey. And I wanted to just assure her that, um, that that wasn't <laughs> what we came away from the survey thinking. Great, thanks for sharing. I, I also um, can't recall any meetings going back from the time I've been on the committee and I think I'm the longest serving person on the screen right now that we've ever brought anybody in to talk about what, exactly what else is going on in town, what issues should be addressed within the priorities. So um, could we, Ben, um, invite someone in from the ECAC to a future meeting just to give them some airtime and tell us about what's going on and what things we might look for uh, in grant proposals that to be addressed or maybe we add that to the RFP so the town has a more global reach Mm -hmm. We're funding money. Yes, housing. Yes, food insecurity. Yes, youth mentoring. Yes, education literacy. But bringing in the climate considerations, since that's first and foremost on everybody's minds, because it's going to be ninety-three this weekend, and it's only May. I know. <laughs> so, um, is that possible to bring somebody in and do a, you know, kind of a, a, a an, an orientation to so we can understand what the committee does and how it could possibly could possibly integrate in their priorities into our priorities and going forward. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that would be possible. Um, I would probably talk to uh, the town has a sustainability coordinator, uh, Stephanie Ciccarello, who does a really wonderful job. And uh, I agree. We could definitely have probably three Stephanies and still not get all of our climate initiatives done. Um, but I can talk to Stephanie about uh, kind of coordinating um, ECAC's work with the block grant program and trying to find overlap. I mean, as you all know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, kind of considerations for when you're spending block grant money in terms of directly serving low and moderate income individuals, you know, having a the program needs to be like an expansion of an existing program. It can't, you know, uh, supplement additional uh, existing funds. So there's kind of all these things that need to be considered that the agencies we do fund do a really good job of um, implementing. And so I would just, you know, it's about finding the right fit, I guess, for, for the funds that can be used to serve, um, you know, a, a, a sustainability purpose. However, I mean, there are the, the, the infrastructure projects, which are, um, you know, still need to serve low and moderate income individuals. But, um, you know, I think maybe that's where we could look to find a project that uh, um, could have more of a, you know, a climate impact or. Yeah, and I thought I sort of understood what Lydia to be saying was was sort of addressing those town projects um, more than um, necessarily the social service ones, but also not that not that it would really be necessarily about um, a particular project, but just how to look at all the mm. applications that are coming in through that climate lens, um, mm -hmm. sort of educating us on that. And I, I would also add that it might make another presentation that would probably be helpful for us would be um, you know, sort of in the diversity equity area and whether I know there, I think there's a new diversity 
a DEI person Correct, who yeah. just hired like in the, in the last couple of weeks, I think in Amherst. So um, I think it's, I think it's a woman I was going to say yeah. that she might not be quite ready to come and present. Um, but that might be another area um, where it would be great to use this time for education. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So the other question I had was, um, you know, based on the uncertainty of the timetable going forward, what are we thinking about for our next meeting and, and um, kind of next steps here? Um, it seems like we need to keep going forward, assuming that there will be a fall schedule. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, what, what would that look like, do you think? Um, I would suggest kind of to stay on track that we um, have another meeting in maybe three or four weeks. Um, at least schedule one? Yeah, at least schedule one. That would be more of a public meeting um, to kind of develop the kind of continued debriefing from today's hearing and to develop the RFP um, and, you know, consider the criteria and um, priorities. Um, and if I can get it together, I could also um, either talk to Stephanie and uh, sustainability coordinator, or, you know, if, if they feel like they're ready, like set up a meeting, okay. have that be okay. some, something of a joint meeting. Yep. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, what is the, um, is there a minimum time frame for scheduling a public meeting? Like you have to give notice of some fashion, right? Oh yeah. So for um, public meeting is just 48 hours. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. So matter. if it's a, if it's a public hearing for like a zoning matter, then it's a, a 14 day notice, but. Okay. I just was curious if there would be some issue with scheduling a meeting. And then if we hear something from them that, that we had to immediately. Right have some okay. lag there yeah no luckily public meetings are uh, just 48 hours so that's makes it easier to schedule and reschedule well maybe at that meeting we could plan it to be sort of about the rfp and if we could also have you know a presentation or a conversation with the sustainability person and maybe the dei person you know, sort of planning on 20 minutes for each of those ish, and then a conversation about priorities and criteria. Does that feel like too much to do in one night? I think we do usually try to keep it to like an hour and a half at the most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's doable. I mean, I, I don't think that they need to really present, even just having somebody on for five minutes and just telling us what their priorities are uh, would be useful. Um, you know, I don't really know how much we're going to be able to do about climate change. I mean, I guess there's food um, waste is a big one um, in that analysis, yeah. but uh, I mean, the social services stuff doesn't seem to, that seems to be a, the largest portion of our time. But the infrastructure projects, you know. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. I think that's a great idea, Becky. Yeah, I like the idea of having someone actually do a little presentation for us, because I, I liked the way you were framing it as using that lens and that that would be helpful to me i know and even actually just because since the all the projects the infrastructure projects are already come from amherst obviously like is there to know what is the foundation the climate principles that the bidding happens on i mean whatever any of like it would just be good to know that probably and, and if if it turns out that they're all great and it's not something that we need to think about because they're all being done in some in the best environmental way they can that's great and if it turns out they're not that would be really useful to know or even a consideration of materials like when watson farms need to be recited like you know right. are we using sustainable materials and then reciting projects for different housing developments or roofing materials so i think that's <clears throat> i think it just makes us more considerate in what we're um as we're reading uh, mm -hmm. proposals and we're well, asking for information. And to Ben's point, it may not impact 
what we're asking for from the social service organizations. It's much more about the infrastructure piece, you know, so, and it's true, we spend way more time talking about the social services than we generally do about the infrastructure, so. But the infrastructure takes up the bulk of the money. So right, it, exactly. it, it's pretty important. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay, any other comments? So Ben, are you gonna, um, since I'm not gonna be here in another two weeks, I'm gonna leave it in everybody's good hands to have continuity on the suggestions that were put forth tonight. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been taking notes. So Great. this meeting will live on forever. <laughs> <laughs> so Ben, can I, I want to ask one more question before yeah. we go, because I know I've raised it before and I thought it was not possible, but we saw tonight that it was, is to have an actual person instead of a screenshot when people present. So when the woman, um, Fakria, I think from um, the literacy yeah. project presented, she was right there and we didn't just have to look yeah. at a picture or a blank screen. Is that something that we can think about or do so, something about? Yeah, no, I, I, I wish um, it could be done. I, so with that um, individual, I, I brought her in as a panelist because I got a message saying she had an outdated version of Zoom and that she couldn't be brought in as a, an attendee for some reason. Um, so the, the issue with bringing folks in as panelists is, well, two, there's two things. One, um, it's we've been advised from the town not to do that just because of Zoom bombing incidents, which I've been a part of and are very, very unpleasant uh, for everyone. Um, and, and when someone's brought in as a panelist, it's a lot harder to kick them out than an attendee. Um, so that's reason. That's kind of the main reason, I guess. So it's just and, and I've been Google. I've been trying to figure out like, why can't and I've been Googling here trying to figure out why attendees can't have their videos being shown. Um, and I don't, it's just one of those things with Zoom. So um, I definitely feel bad about it because it feels impersonal, but I don't know if there's much we can do. Is it because where the format's not a Zoom meeting, but it's a webinar and then the webinar kind of divides up between panelists and attendees and what capacities they each have. So maybe if it wasn't a webinar and it was a regular Zoom meeting, but I think because of the town's requirements, we can't do that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I know the town council is going through the same thing. They are like, I think, considering like petitioning Zoom or something for better abilities because it, it, it is it is a shame, I think. Yeah. Well, when we get back to meeting in person, we won't have that issue. Um, yeah. But on the flip side, we will have the issue where it's less accessible, right? People yeah. actually have to come in person if that's yeah. the only way. So yeah. it's hard to kind of have everything, but. Yep. Okay. So I, I my computer froze for some reason for a little bit. So I didn't hear if there was a next um, date on the calendar or you're waiting to hear back from the state to figure that out. Um. I'd appreciate appreciate getting something on the calendar just so we have it. Um, one, two, three. Yeah, I would say they're June 9th or 16th. Um, if we want to continue with the Thursdays. The I, can't, I can't do either of those. June 10th is high school graduation. So that's kind of oh, a gotcha. moment first for, I guess, one of us. <laughs> um, and I'm going to be away the 16th. OK. Um, would a, a Tuesday meeting work for folks, June 7th, possibly, or June 14th? I could do the 7th. I couldn't do the 14th. It'll be away, yeah. I leave the morning of the 15th. Okay. Yeah, 7th Is June be... 23rd too late? Um, That's great for me. Great or too late, Becky? Great. Great, yeah. I think I might my presence might be required at a town council meeting oh, that okay. night. Um, but in theory, that might be done by 5.30, so I could <laughs> do both, take the Friday off or something. <laughs> <laughs> that seems good. <laughs> so, and the other thing about pushing it you know, a, a month out is it might be um, more con not more convenient, but more conducive to bringing in a guest when they have a month's notice as opposed mm -hmm. to two or three weeks, if that's the way we want to go in the next meeting. Yeah. To bring in Stephanie Chabrello. Yep. Okay. So, 
June 23rd. I don't know if my term ends June 1 or June 30. I, I'm it's not June sure. uh, 30th. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we're on for June 23rd. Yeah. Okay. All right. And Ben, you'll reach out to Stephanie? Okay, and, and, and then obviously, if you have news from the state prior to that, it'll be part of the agenda. So we have something kind of hard and fast to rely on. Yeah, exactly. Schedule, with scheduling, that, then we'd create a schedule going forward. Yep, okay. exactly, yeah. And then, um, Gail, it's at your discretion because it's a public meeting, but there are we have public comment on the agenda for the public meeting portion, um, and there's two hands raised. Okay. Do we want to go forth if people can keep it exceedingly brief, like I just, you know, a minute or two? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So all uh, we have, um, I think, yeah, it's Lydia Brennan Jones. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to say about the the Zoom meetings. I interviewed people in both Greenfield and Northampton. They have open Zoom meetings. Everybody sees who's at the meeting. Everybody knows who gets. You know, everything is visible and has been the whole time under COVID. Amherst is very unusual that we have a system. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I would encourage you to push against it. Um, yeah. But I also, I, I just raised my hand to see how to communicate with your com committee. There are things I could send you from HUD that might help you on the climate issue, but how to spend the money. I would love to be able to send things. Should I send them to the chair or individuals on the committee um you can send them to me and i'll distribute them to the Great. committee members okay. thank you okay thank you lydia any other comment and the other person and then lydia my email is available on the town's website or on the uh you know the meeting link for the for this mm -hmm. meeting if, if that if you can't find it so thanks Okay. All right, I think we're good. And there's somebody else, Ben? Uh, no, it's just Lydia's hand again. All right. I went to, I, I, before she got off, I wanted to ask when she says she's attended meetings in other towns, is it of the town council, the city council, what type of meeting? Right. That has a, has a different Zoom format than, than we do. I was kind of curious. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to my colleagues about that. I assume it's still a town policy I just yeah i don't know <laughs> okay any and um any unanticipated what's the category uh not anticipated within 48 hours <laughs> anything else coming up nope uh not just just like usual waiting to hear something from the state it seems to be the okay so we're on for june 23rd um, and we're still Zoom. That's a decision that the town has made. Yeah, I mean, we um, we're author. We can meet in person. Um, it's just we we have the ability to meet via Zoom and until July first, um, unless that is extended. So, um, you know, technically, you know, since it's not a public meeting or public hearing. It, it'll just be more internal discussion. I, you know, we could meet in person. Um, I, I haven't heard of any committees meeting in person, but- um, Heard of any meeting? Not really, none of my colleagues oh. are doing in-person meetings right now. Um, but uh, except for town council does a hybrid format, but- could we, could we just like play it by ear and maybe make a decision in the June 1st or something? How, yeah. how how do yeah. people feel about it before I just have, do people, it would be really nice to meet in person. Yeah. Anybody ha feel strongly one way or another? I like it would, <laughs> it would be really nice, but I also feel like cases are going up so much. I don't know. It is very convenient to do this. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, so much of my life is on Zoom. It doesn't feel that much different from meeting in person. I mean, you don't have little side chats, you know, and that's too bad, but um. I also just, I, I can't imagine that it wouldn't, I mean, for other people who want to just come and observe the meeting or just kind of have it on, um, I just think Zoom is, makes everything so much more accessible for people. But um, obviously if we 
vote to do it in person, I'll be there. Okay. Anybody else have an opinion? Suzanne, Gregory? I was just gonna say, I mean, if the purpose of the meeting is to really work out the RFP and the priorities, sometimes that kind of work can be easier in person if you're, I, I don't know how your process has been in the past, but are you writing stuff out? Are you bulleting things? Or, you know, is it easier for people to see? But this format, um, like others have said, is very accessible. and. This is where I live a lot of the time of the day. So it's it's certainly easy. Thanks, Gregory. Do you have an opinion? No, I don't have a preference either way, it would be fine with me. Okay. Thank you. Whatever the committee wants to do. Matt. I guess my experience on the committee is that it has been good to have in-person meetings, although it's been a while. Um, but um, um, you know, who knows where case counts are going and if as we get closer um, it doesn't seem as comfortable uh, maybe that's a different situation but at this point i would certainly be comfortable and would you know, be happy to have an in-person meeting and i think it would help the committee and we, we can be masked you know we can be separated if we meet in town upstairs in the town hall there's plenty of room and open the windows i mean i think that there's an, definitely enough space to keep us separated lucas mm -hmm. I don't have an opinion. I'm happy to do anything. Wow. Whatever. I wish I were married to you. <laughs> <laughs> my, my life would be so much easier. <laughs> um, all right. So can we just wait until like June 1st? I mean, that's two weeks. Yeah. See where yeah. Are. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Again, we don't need to, um, I, you know, I think for the benefit of members of the public, we should post the, you know, or let folks know about the meeting location, maybe a, a week out or something, but technically we don't need to post it until 48 hours before, but um, so we can, you know, definitely check, call, check in closer to the day. I'll make a note right now, question mark in person or Zoom. Okay. I'm right. kind of assuming that if you hear something, we're probably going to meet relatively quickly at that point. Um, Sorry. Yeah, if it's extended until fall. march well if it's the fall though we're probably gonna have to go yeah yeah exactly yeah okay any other questions or comments no all right um can i make a motion to adjourn the meeting i thought this is very productive and i think it was it's great always great to hear from organizations about what they're doing and what their concerns are um, especially with covid and the refugee crisis and um, the challenges they face. So I think it's really helpful to have these meetings and especially for the newcomers. And thank you, Gregory and Susan. Um, if you have any questions, I think you can easily reach out to any of us on the committee for clarification or points of information or just to chat. So don't be shy about that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Subject, subject to Welcome. public meeting rules. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> all right, we all set then? Yep, we're all set. Okay, thank you for everybody. Good night, everyone. Good to see everybody. Thank you. Nice to see you. Yeah. Good night, Good night. Good night. Good night.